Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is John Merwin, and I'm going to be talking about some work that I uh, started at Columbia University, but have since been continuing at the American Museum of Natural History uh, with Glenn Seeholzer and Brian Smith on the evolution of a clade of uh, colorful tropical birds. And avian plumage diversity is so interesting to study because birds are amazingly colorful. They use a variety of mechanisms to generate this color. Um, they have structural colors that make blues and UV color and uh, pigments like carotenoids and melanins, and plumage color in birds um, is so biologically important because it plays a strong role in camouflage and processes like sexual selection. And in many cases, color is thought to have adaptive significance. Uh, one study found that birds, the Malphagidae, could be specific in more arid environments in Australia, uh, had brighter colored dorsal plumage. And this is a good example of Glogger's rule, which basically states that birds in more arid environments uh, have brighter plumage, and this is thought to be for both thermal regulation and antibacterial reasons and background matching. And color is also sometimes a key component um, of elaborate sexually selected phenotypes, such as in the birds of paradise. And these are just a couple of examples of the highly elaborate colors uh, of birds of paradise, which are integral to their complicated courtship displays. And this elaborate color diversification is driven uh, by females selecting specifically for these elaborate phenotypes. And we wanted to understand how these kinds of processes intersect in the lorries and the lorikeens. They're collectively referred to as the Triglorianidae. They're a really colorful clade. They have deep blues and bright yellows and greens, uh, purples and UV coloration. And they're ecologically really interesting because they have a brush tip tongue uh, for feeding from flowers, as you can see on the bottom left. And um, they have in Australia, uh, New Guinea, Indo-West Pacific distribution. And so what you might also notice is that these birds have color uh, distributed in discrete patches across their bodies, and it looks like these patches appear and disappear across their evolutionary history almost at random. And fundamentally, what we were trying to get at is how do these super colorful plumage phenotypes evolve? That is, are the different regions on the bodies of these birds evolving under the same evolutionary forces, or do separate evolutionary pressures act on the different feather regions of these birds? And as with a lot of complex traits, plumage evolution is driven by both stochastic and deterministic forces. And this interaction is really clear in sexually dichromatic taxa, such as the eclectus parrots, where the females are a bright red and blue color, and the males are this really bright green. And there's also sex-based role partitioning in the species. The males uh, forage, and the females find and compete over nest sites and guard them. And mating system-wise, the green males are choosing between the red females. And it's thought that the red and the purple of the female serves to advertise nesting sites to males better. Um, meanwhile, the green color of the male serves as camouflage against predators while they're foraging and moving between different females. And this example really neatly illustrates this inter intersection of uh, sexual selection and natural selection in parrots. Uh, but in lorikeets, instead of this pattern partitioning happening uh, between sexes, like in eclectus parrots, we wanted to test if it was happening along the dorsoventral axis. Like on that rainbow lorikeet up there, which has a really this really bright uh, blue and orange front, but that light green dorsal side. And what we're really getting at is are the different forces drive plumage evolution in uh, different body regions. So the first step to investigating that question was to quantify color. Uh, we used a UV sensitive camera to take uh, UV and visible light photographs of the lateral, ventral, and dorsal sides of around 100 taxa. And from the images, we extracted uh, RGB, red, green, blue, and UV measurements for 35 plumage patches on each bird, scaling to account for the camera model that we used, and also a blue tip spectral sensitivity model, which is another bird with UV sensitive vision close to that of Paris. And the image on the bottom there is a false color image to emphasize in bright blue there are the regions of this ultramarine lorikeet, which are UV reflected. And so it's really important to capture that variation. And here's a diagram basically showing the full workflow for one bird, the 35 patches which we sampled, and then how they map onto a patch map, which is basically a digital cartoon of the bird that we drew uh, so we can visualize their data. And then using that outline as a shape file, we can fill in each patch using the red, green, blue values that we extracted. And then we can get these representations that you can see on the bottom uh, right there uh, to visually tell how closely our data represents the actual color of the full bird. And so on the left here are the patch maps that we generated from our data. Uh, and on the right are field guide plates. And qualitatively, we can see that they look really similar across species. And we've done a good job of capturing the interspecific variation. And then we map these images onto the tips of a phylogenetic tree to better visualize the distribution of uh, colors in the clade. 
And so plotting the patch maps on the tree really allows us to visually explore color evolution, but for our downstream comparative analyses, we use the principal components of the four-dimensional color data. And this approach let us look at uh, brightness and hue separately, which have been shown to be influenced by discrete evolutionary forces. And as you can see on this plot, uh, where PC1 is on the x-axis, that represents achromatic variation, so brightness, and PC2 is hue variance, so that's uh, chromatic variance like through different colors. And to better understand how color is distributed across the tree, we map values of exemplar patches of PC2 onto the phylogeny. So included here is one example, uh, crown color as compared to uh, wing length, a proxy for body size, maps onto the phylogeny. Um, and what we can see in this analysis, first of all, is that wing length is much more phylogenetically conserved than crown color, and that most species within Lorikeet genera are similar, similarly sized, and that closely related taxa can have really disparate colors, which makes sense considering that color can change really dramatically with small genetic or regulatory changes. And this demonstrates how traits respond under variable phylogenetic constraint, but it remains still really unclear how this constraint is partitioned between different feather regions. And fundamentally, what we're asking is, has plumage evolved as a composite trait, like height, or has it evolved as a single trait, uh, like something like sickle cell anemia? And if color is indeed evolving as a composite trait, will the evolutionary models which best explain this variation cluster in the different body regions, uh, like in the eclectus to trigoglossus example I mentioned earlier? And so to test this, we fit hue and brightness for each patch uh, to alternative evolutionary models to better understand how the evolution of this extremely labile trait evolves on a macroevolutionary scale. And we use the fit continuous package in Giger to select best fit models based on AICC scores. We compared four models of trait evolution, a white noise random model, a Brownian motion model, an ornstein uhlenbeck or OU model, and a delta model. And while a large body of work has asserted that you can't infer process from relative model fitting, uh, the evolution of traits under natural selection is often thought to be best described by an OU process, whereas stochastic processes like sexual selection and drift are often better described by Brownian motion. And we also tested for absolute fit, so in order to quantify the absolute fit of these models, we calculated six statistics uh, using the R package Arbutus, which compares statistics about simulated predictions of generated models uh, to empirical trait values which you use to generate those models in the first place. So on these six uh, histograms, when the red line is within two standard deviations of the mean of the black histogram for one of those statistics, then that statistic supports that model. And if it deviates, then it doesn't support it. So we filtered models that were supported by fewer than four of these uh, statistics. And primarily, models were rejected due to unaccounted for rate heterogeneity. And so these are the best fit models that we found for each patch. Each color represents a different model. Red is OU, yellow is Brownian motion, and blue is delta. And indeed, most of the models that were selected had strong absolute fit, and those that were eliminated were colored in gray. And when we look at these two patch maps, we can see that different body regions have grouped with different models. And so for PC1, brightness, we, what we can see is that the wing and the crown brightnesses have evolved really quickly alongside the phylogeny, whereas the breast and the face brightnesses have been constrained over time. But in PC2, which is hue, we see the opposite pattern, where the face and the breast uh, patches have been diversifying, along with the phylogeny, and the wing and the back hue have remained constrained over time. But this approach of modeling all of our patches independently assumes that all of our selected patches are actually evolving independently. And when you assume independence, that can lead to model misspecification. So to examine how patches co-vary, we generated a phylogenetic variance covariance matrix in R using rate matrix, basically just throwing all of our data into that. So in this plot, Darker blue means higher covariance. Um, and we found that when we fit best fit models to all patches at once, an OU model was the best fit. But when we found best fit models for the uh, subsets within this covariance analysis, we found that OU models best fit the back and the wing regions, while the delta model best fit the regions on the face and the breast patches. And although the developmental architecture that structures feather uh, region development requires further study, we did find that there were clusters of correlated patches on the wing, breast, and face. And these regions may be developmentally or ontogenetically linked or under similar selective regimes. And this suggests that fitting one model to all plumage patches at once may miss some of the fine-grained variation uh, between a really complex uh, trait like plumage, so between different plumage regions. And this may bias model selection um, and suggest that model fits can be dependent on your sampling scheme uh, without uh, adequate assessment. And therefore, 
uh, we think that the multi-patch model fitting actually supports the conclusions from our independent model fit, independent patch analysis, so that patterns of plumage evolution have been indeed partitioned between these different body regions, and that plumage color has been conserved on the wings while it's varied much more widely on the face and the breast patches. And so to that end, we thought it was really important to think about which colors were most conserved in the wings across the phylogeny. And this animation is cycling through the colors of two genera, Trichoglossus and Laureus. So as you can see, although the hue of the faces, chest, and abdomens of these birds um, are changing really wildly, the wings are mostly remaining green, but the brightness of that green is shifting. And overall, we quantified and modeled uh, patterns of color evolution in lorikeets to understand how color evolution is partitioned across the body. And we found that wing color in general was conserved as green, but wing brightness varied alongside the phylogeny. And we found the opposite pattern on the face and the breast patches. And this demonstrates that color in the clade has evolved as a composite trait, likely due to multiple interacting and opposing evolutionary processes. And the grouping of models is partitioned along that dorsal ventral axis, like we initially thought. And our analyses have overall supported the idea that while wing and back hue have been generally conserved in this group, head, face, and uh, chest patches have oscillated between really different colors really quickly, but they've been conserved in brightness. And the reason for this might be that natural selection may have conserved the wing and back colors of these birds as green, potentially to stay disguised and hidden when they're feeding in the canopies. And we know that these birds are preyed upon by raptors, uh, and so camouflage from the dorsal side or counter shading may be particularly useful. But the faces and the chest have varied, likely either in response to drift, sexual selection, or some kind of social selection. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. So this is a super naive question. I normally think of brightness and hue as visual colors. What's the role of UV? Was it mostly absent in these birds? So, so they, can, they can see UV, so it's, right. a, it's a visual color for them. Um, and it basically, there, there is a lot of UV variation. It mostly pops up in the crown and on the lower abdomen. Um, and in some clades, in some other clades of birds, it's been found to be involved in, there's like a lot of birds where it's, they're sexually dichromatic, specifically in the UV spectrum. Right. So it might uh, represent an area of color space that the birds can see, but maybe predators can't. So that could be a reason for, for that. Yes? Uh, those uh, patches you defined, are those based on developmental feather tracks, or are those just like? So, so, pat so patches are generally, they're, they're subsets of feather tracks. So. We basically defined it based on looking at the variation uh, of these birds, looking at plates and specimens, and also uh, like feather topology maps in handbooks, yeah. Yes? First of all, you got great hair. <laughs> um, and the second question I have is just sort of, uh, again, another naive question, I guess, but not so much on, on birds. But I was curious, you mentioned fixation in certain areas and certain patches. and more sort of variability in others, and I'm curious if maybe there's a sense that, like, there's fixation that sort of uh, guards against predation that allows for the more robust, like, expansion variability and sexual variation, like, are those supposed to be linked, or a trade-off? There, sort of? there, there's definitely a trade-off where, you know, the brighter and flashier you are, potentially the more visible you're going to be to predators. Um, and in some groups, they think that the, that, uh, specifically, that counter shading is what allows that diversification. Mm -hmm. And there, although most of these birds are sexually monochromatic, so the males and the females look really similar, yeah. uh, there's one small group where there is dichromatism, and that dichromatism is clustered in the face patches and the crown patches mm -hmm. and the abdominal patches. But we haven't fully quantified that dichromatism. Yeah. Thanks so much.